The December 12th, uh, 2022 uh, Wichita Board of Education meeting is called to order. We appreciate everyone being with us today. The Wichita Public Schools will be the district of choice and of our region where all students and staff are empowered to dream, believe, and achieve. Um, as we begin uh, tonight's meeting, I want to share just a quick message from um, our Vice President, uh, Julie Hedrick. Uh, approximately a month ago, Julie's husband, uh, Father Terry Hedrick, experienced an emergency medical issue, and he now awaits a liver transplant. Julie is currently with her husband and is unable to be at our meeting tonight. She will continue to remain engaged in BOE matters, but regrets that her physical presence may be absence uh, at time uh, as, we, as they walk this journey together. Julie also encourages me to invite all of you to consider indicating on your driver's license your willingness to be an organ donor. She has learned through this very difficult process that one individual has the potential to save the lives of eight others. Um, I lost a daughter in June, uh, excuse me, May of 2022 this year, and she was an uh, organ donor, and uh, we know that the lives that she saved had a big impact on their families. So please check your driver's license and see if you are an uh, organ donor. And uh, we will all keep uh, Julie, Father Terry, and their family in our prayers. Um, and if, if you would just think of them uh, uh, when we have our moment of silence, uh, that would be great. And also, unfortunately, we have Ernestine Crable tonight is ill, um, and we, she is missing as well. But we uh, have business to do, and we uh, will proceed, and, and we have a quorum, so, and we are confident that we can get this business done. So if you join me in a moment of silence. Thank you very much. Tonight, we are honored to have the Hamilton Middle School Leadership Class, our junior ROTC, um, led tonight by guard, uh, guard Cadet Lily Ann Morales Garcia, Commander Cadet First Sergeant Naraya Harris. Kansas flag will be carried by Cadet Sergeant First Class Uona. Uh, excuse me, Lestat Uona, and guards will be, cadet will be Dequana Barlow. Would you please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance? Post the colors. You may be seated, and let's give uh, Hamilton Jun Junior ROTC a big round of applause. Patrick, first item, please. 
First item, under reports, Superintendent's Student Advisory Council. We welcome you and we look forward to your presentation. Thank you. Good evening, President Reeser, Dr. Thompson, and the board. My name is Eli Ustash. I'm 18 and I'm a senior at Northwest. I'm Elena Alvarez. I'm 16 and I am also a junior at Northwest. Uh, today, we will be re representing uh, the Super Super SAC um, students uh, that attended. Uh, the Super Super SAC is an event that is held uh, by the Wichita Public Schools um, where 10 representatives per high school come together and talk about a subject. Well, the subject that we were talking about was graduation plus and the advantages for students. So the first question was, tell us everything you know about graduation plus. Well, almost if not all the kids within Super Super SAC did not know what graduation plus really was. So we did have a presentation offered to us, and the main takeaways we took away from that were the AP classes, um, other rigorous courses such as Biomed, AVID, ECA, and IB. But what, one thing that we did discuss at our Super SAC meeting was how can we make Graduation Plus more student friendly, or how can we design Graduation Plus better for students to understand what it really is? Okay, the next question they asked us. Uh, what market value asset is the most important to you and why? Um, a lot of students uh, were talking about work-based learning. Um, I know that personally me, I really enjoy going and seeing the things, you know, that I'd be able to go do with my life. And I know that a lot of students, you know, a lot of seniors, juniors, we really like to go and um, see the opportunities that are out there for us, especially internships and, you know, pipelines that can lead to um, a future for us. The third question was, what is the best way to recognize students who earn these market value assets? Well, the number one answer was public recognition. Public recognition meaning either verbally by like teachers or students, or even um, through morning announcements, or through special cores for graduations or objects such as plaques, medals, and even letterman jacket patches. Our final question was, how do you better inform and engage students to make you aware of the opportunities that your school has to help your, you plan for success after high school? Um, um, one thing that we did talk about, especially at the Super SAC meeting um, that we just had on the 7th, um, we talked about starting to promote in middle school, sending high schoolers uh, to the schools, you know, I know that a lot of middle schoolers love to see, you know, a lot of the older kids come in and share about the different programs that they're getting to go through. Um, we also talked about student-run uh, media. No offense to any adults, um, but I know that a lot of the students, you know, it would definitely be a little cool to see and to be able to relate to some people and a little bit of the trends that are going on right now. You know, a great example is WSU Tech's TikTok page. They're doing a really good job on sharing what their school has to offer. Um, we do have one last question. In our last Super SAC meeting, we did ask this question regarding the advanced learning classes for like UCA, Biomed, IB. So how could we expand these opportunities across the school so students can gain easier access to them? For example, the Southeast student wanted to do ECA. How could we expand the opportunities to different schools so that they don't have to drive those 45 minutes all the way across town to Northwest. And that's the end. So if you guys have any questions. <laughs> I had a question. I appreciate you taking the effort to explain Graduation Plus. Um, my father's generation, the easiest way I've been able to explain it is my father's generation he was one of six children, and he was the only one that graduated. So the emphasis was to graduate, uh, and it was, a, it was a hit and miss effort. My generation, it was graduate and then go on to something after graduation. We are now 
uh, this board should be very proud of the fact that graduation plus is making your high school diploma a meaningful thing as opposed to just a piece of paper. Uh, you will have either job experience or you will have extra credit in college already by the time you graduate the Wichita Public Schools. Uh, did your students, did your super, super SAC agree that this was a good progress that we're making or is this something that we should uh, uh, re-examine at any time? Overall, is the general philosophy in the right direction for your generation? So we, in Super Super SAC, we do separate into different groups. And I know that my group really enjoyed the fact of the progress that we were making, but we also want to kind of push more to see how we can improve the progress that we're making and make it better for students, not just in one school, but the whole district, starting not only high school, but for middle schoolers, so that they know how and when, like what the Graduation Plus is and how they can live up to those expectations. Um, yeah, my group as well. Um, I, I know that there was one kid in my group that really appreciated a lot of the college credit opportunities that we get to have. Um, but yeah, there is kind of, you know, the confusion of even what is it and how can students, you know, better relate to try and get into it. Um, I'm not saying that falls under media, but I know that, um, you know, especially with the student run media, you know, you could definitely p push the district's agenda with, you know, relatability. Uh, Dr. Thompson, how long have we been doing uh, graduation plus? I think we are in year two. So I was wondering if you could uh, give each board member after this meeting's over, you can email it to us, uh, this presentation in a hard copy because we need your suggestions as well to get the word out about what we are doing with our graduation plus. And I apologize, we have a new uh, queue system. I didn't raise my hand, so I'll uh, give myself one demerit. Did anyone else have a question? Perfect. Did I do it right? Yes, you did. Thank you. Thank Go you. ahead, Kathy. Thank you. I just want to commend you guys. I was at your table for this meeting, and I am so impressed. I am delightfully impressed with the caliber, the um, collaborativeness that you guys have together, the creativity that you come up with. I am so proud of you. Plus, I love Northwest High School. Go Grizzlies. Oh. <laughs> Good job. Thank you, Kathy. Any other questions or comments for our students? Thank you very much, and we appreciate this presentation, and please get us a, a hard, hard copy of this as well. Uh, this is something we definitely want to keep expanding and explaining to the public on uh, making our uh, graduation meaningful. And we'd like to thank you for giving us the opportunity to, uh, to do this for you guys. Thank you. Thank you. I'm just changing the thing. Patrick, next item, please. Next item, under reports, good news. Welcome, Wendy. Thank you very much. These two are rock stars. Yeah. They are. We have an amazing high school student leadership group, um, and I hope our entire community can continue to see their influence. Thank you, Eli. Uh, can continue to see their influence as they grow and become future leaders in our community. It was really exciting to hear their input. We have three fabulous good news items tonight that will, frankly, just make you feel pretty doggone good. Uh, we have two student celebrations, and we have an opportunity to recognize some of the veterans and gems in our district that work as part of our custodial crew in our buildings that have served in our district, served our kids and our staff for decades. So it's a pleasure that you'll have a chance to meet all of these individuals tonight. We're gonna to start out by celebrating our National Merit semifinalists. This year our semifinalists are from East High School 
and Amanda Kingry, our Assistant Superintendent of Secondary Schools, will take the opportunity to introduce you to these phenomenal young people. Welcome, Amanda. Hello, good evening, President Reeser, Superintendent Dr. Thompson and the board. I am here today to celebrate with you five students um, who are semi-finalists for the National Merit Scholarship Program. All five of these students just happen to be from East High School and their principal that's sneaking by right here, Sarah Richardson, is the principal of East High School. So you probably wonder what does that mean if they are a National Merit semifinalist. So high school juniors entered the 2023 National Merit Scholarship Program by taking the 2021 preliminary SAT National Merit Scholarship Qualifying Test, which is the PSAT NMSQT, if you need to know, uh, which served as an initial screen for the program entrance. The nationwide pool of semifinalists representing less than 1% of high school seniors. These students represent less than 1% of high school seniors includes the highest scoring entrance in each state. So from there's around 16,000 semifinalists across the nation and more than 15,000 of them are actually expected to advance to the finalist level and in February these uh, students will know whether or not they will be um, a finalist or not. So this is a high honor um, to even be considered as a semifinalist. Like I said, this is the top 1% in the nation that um, are, are these students. So we just wanted to make sure that we recognize um, them today. And so I'm gonna um, introduce each and every one of them. So I have Esther, Lou. <laughs> and Nathan Balderas, and Augustin Au, Jackson Kleeman, and Kate Hallaby. And again, I want to recognize um, the administrator, Sarah Richardson, who is here to help support them as well as any family members. If there are any family members of these students, if you could please stand because we appreciate your support to help get your student where they are today. So could you please stand so we can recognize you? All right, thank you so much for letting us have time today. So do you have some questions for any of our students? I'll play Julie Hedrick tonight. tonight. She always would like uh, each student to come up, restate your name, and then give us a brief recap of your plans for the future. Ernestine would ask that question too. Hi, uh, my name is Esther. Um, currently I plan on going to higher education in electrical engineering. Um, not sure where I'll go yet, but we'll see. Yeah. Perfect, thank you. Yeah, uh, hello, my name is Nathan Balderas. Um, I plan to go to higher education as well in um, either economics or mathematics. Um, my name is August Anau. I'm not sure where I'm going to college yet, but I plan on going into somewhere in the medical field. My name is Jackson Kleeman, and I'm also not sure where I'll be going hopefully for something STEM related, and I might use swimming to help me get there. My name is Kate Halby. I also don't know where I'm going, but hopefully I'll be able to pursue political science or international relations. Do you have any other questions for us? Cheryl. Yes, I just wanted to say from the board, congratulations to all of you. Uh, we recognize how big a deal this really is. And I'm not at all surprised that you haven't made up your mind what school you're going to, because I know you're applying to many schools, <laughs> and we'll wait and see what comes in. And, and when we have the, the end of the year scholarships awards, you'll be right up there with big scholarships to whatever school you choose. So 
congratulations. We are really proud of you. And we, we uh, want to say again that we appreciate all the teachers that are uh, these students, teachers and educators, and that help guide them in this uh, effort. And we really appreciate their efforts as well. For our second item, we have a chance to recognize a group of custodians in our district that have served either 20 or 30 years. I remember when my son was in elementary school, um, one of the individuals he talked about most was the custodian, Mr. Barry, at Mueller Elementary, who always spent time with the kids, played ball with the kids. So you can't underestimate the importance that our custodial staff has on the lives of our kiddos. I am pleased to invite not only Albert Jackson, our custodial supervisor, but also our honorees who can come up and stand to my left so we can celebrate you. Good evening, President Reeser, Dr. Thompson, and members of the board. I come here this evening to celebrate the longevity and service of several of our custodians to USD 259. As many of you are aware, our custodians are often called on to perform various tasks. In addition to routine maintenance and cleaning, our custodians act as the first line of defense. They are frequently heard conversing with students, helping a teacher, and often listening and helping students each day. Standing with me this evening are a few custodians who have served in our district for two to three decades. We have Rob Garcia, 32 years in the district. Rob has a Rob has a passion for helping others. Rob states, our department has worked tirelessly to get through various staffing changes. Since, jo since joining the custodial department supervisory team, Rob says, I am grateful for the job that I have and the things that I've been able to accomplish as a custodian and supervisor for USD 259. We also have joining us Farm McCoy, 30 years at Dunbar. Farm states going above and beyond his job expectations give him, gives him the most joy at work. Farm likes to keep busy and loves being around the students. In addition, he states he works hard to ensure staff and students have a clean and safe environment. Thank you, Farm. <laughs> Joining us this evening, we also have Johnny McKenzie, 27 years at Ortiz. What gives Johnny the most joy at work is being around the kids and interacting with them. He takes pride in keeping his building clean and serving others. His inspiration is from older custodians that have mentored him and that have gone on to retire. In absence, we have Farron Robinson, 20 years at Adam Elementary, Tony De La Garza, 20 years at Colvin Elementary, and in our presence, we also have Christopher Hughes Peterson Elementary. Christopher has worked with the district for 20 years. He states that it is a joy to see the daily interaction with students and staff. Chris believes being an effective custodian starts with providing a clean environment for the students and staff. Chris states, I am satisfied knowing I'm effective so that teachers and students can come to school and focus on what they are here for. Thank you, Chris. In closing, I'd like to mention Dr. Thompson on behalf of the custodial department. Thank you for bringing so much joy and dedication to our district. We are going to miss your energy and positivity. Thank you so much. I've personally seen 
uh, at least half that group in action, and they are an outstanding group. And um, I never have liked that phrase from the janitor on up because that is not true. We could not do it without our custodial staff, and they go well beyond the call of duty. So we thank you for that. To close good news tonight, it is such a pleasure to introduce you to a delightful group of young people whose artwork you will see driving through downtown Wichita this holiday season. And I drove over the weekend just to be sure I could see the banners and it's really, really cool to see the artwork of our kids gracing our community. So without further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce Sean Chastain, our executive coordinator of fine arts. And I think we get to invite this wonderful group of young people forward to meet you all. Welcome, Sean. Thank you, Wendy. And at this time, I would like to invite our student art award winners and their teachers down to this staging area so that we can recognize you and proceed with our event. Okay, board, would you like them down front? Or would you like them over to the... Thank you, Dr. Thompson, for helping organizing our wonderful award winners, and thank you, teachers, also for being here with us this evening. I also would like to invite everyone to view this wonderful district award-winning holiday banner artwork on the screens as uh, we make tonight's presentations. I also want to thank Marcia Skirfield, WPS Visual Arts Curriculum Specialist, for joining me and also organizing this beautiful slideshow. Thank you also to our WPS Elementary Visual Arts faculty who submitted these wonderful digital images and especially to those in attendance tonight. Joshua Thompson Williams from Black Elementary, James Schofield from Buckner Elementary, Eva Phillips from Enders, Katherine Jansen also from Griffith and Jefferson, and Christina Wynn from Isley, and I think I saw Julie Adams from McLean, and Trisha Burroughs from Ortiz, and Cindy Ponick from Woodland, and uh, also want to recognize Monica Morris from Harry Street. So how about a round for our teachers down here that helped coordinate this wonderful work? This fall, as Wendy mentioned, over 280 WPS fourth grade art students participated in downtown Wichita's second annual Holiday Street Banner Design Contest. Each student created unique artwork along the theme of hometown holidays. Representing all of these student entries, 22 designs from 10 WPS elementary schools were selected for printing on banners that are currently displayed along Douglas Avenue from Washington to Topeka. And in addition to those 22 banners, eight banners were also selected for window displays along Douglas. Student winners know we are very honored to have so many of you in attendance tonight. While we are looking forward to meeting you in just a minute, I know we are proud of all of our WPS entries, which can be viewed on the website downtownwichita.org. And speaking of downtown Wichita, I also want to thank Emily Brookover, downtown Wichita's Community Director of Development, for joining us tonight and for her longtime support of this event. Emily, your vision of collaborating with us several years ago and then sticking with us through the pandemic to see this project come to life is greatly appreciated. Emily even presented this year at our district in service and I'm convinced that it helped double our number of school participants and almost triple our number of entries. So Emily, I know you didn't want to say anything tonight, but I would like you to stand and so we can recognize <laughs> and thank you for this opportunity. So Emily and I crunched the numbers this morning, and with last year's 23 downtown banners back up for display, and this year's 22 banners, which were double printed, plus the eight artworks in the windows, means that we have over 75 WPS elementary artworks along Douglas Avenue for the holidays. <laughs> and
And perhaps best of all, we also moved this good, good news item up from January last year to December this year, as Wendy mentioned, so we all have time to drive down Douglas Avenue and enjoy the artwork. Well, again, uh, while we have an upfront look at these award-winning students and faculty, we also would like to recognize any parents and administrators of these students that are with us tonight in the audience. So parents, administrators, family members, we would invite you to stand or wave so that we can give thanks for your support of these talented students. Thank you for being here tonight. Okay, and Marcia, if you can help me with this. Now for the main event, we would like to ask these winning student artists to join us briefly here at the microphone and introduce themselves and also share with us their banner title. So students, if you'd like to come up, we just would like you to share your name and your school and, the, and the, your banner title. Where do you want them to face, Sean, so they can be seen? <laughs> this is Allison, everybody. Everybody give her a round of applause. My name's Tegan Williams, um, and I'm from Isley Elementary, and the title of my artwork is The Special Present Under the Tree. I'm Stella Stand next. Haney, and my school is Isley Elementary, and my title is The Ornament. <laughs> my name is Cara Rennick. My school is Isley Elementary, and my banner's title is Snowman Fun. <laughs> my name is Ailise Carter. My the school I'm from is Buckner Elementary, and my banner title is Dr. Martin Luther King Day. <laughs> my name is Wyatt, and the school I go to is Griffith Elementary, and my title of my picture is um, Hanukkah. <laughs> my name is Owen. I'm from McLean Elementary, and the name of, of my picture is Snowman in a Blizzard. <laughs> Katie, I'm from Woodland Elementary, and my ba yeah, banner so name, yeah. banner title is the Special Christmas Tree. My name is Amaya Grayson, and I'm from Griffith Elementary, and my title is Point Setter. Um, hi, my name is Joe Dallas, and I'm from Griffith Elementary, and my banner title is the. Candy Cane Gingerbread House. <laughs> my name, my name is Vincent. And what else? Woodland. Woodland. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> my name is Raina. And the school that I go to is Jefferson Elementary. My banner's title is Snowman Lady. <laughs> my name is Eric, and the school I go to is Ortiz, and my title is called The Best Winter Ever. My name is Jordan, and, this, and the school I go to is Enders Elementary, and the title of my banner is A Gingerbread Woman. Hi, 
Hi, my name is Robert Moore. I'm from Ender's Op Open Magnet Elementary School, and my name is and my portrait's name is Slay 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 Slay. Yeah. <laughs> what do I say? Hi, my name is Jaden, and my school is Ender's Open Magnet Elementary School. And my banner title is The Night Before Christmas. <laughs> Hi, my name is Yuretsi, and the school that I go to is Ender's Open Magnet Elementary School. My title of my banner is The Candles. Hi, my name is Kinsley Goldby. The school I go to is Ender's Open Magnet Elementary School. My title of my ban banner is Candy King. My name is Lily and I go, the school I go to is Ender's Open Magnet Elementary School and the, and the name of my banner is One Snowy Night. Thank you again, student artists, art teachers, administrators, and family members for being here. And following this good news item, Mrs. Skirfield and I will be distributing to each of you a beautiful certificate of recognition prepared by our district strategic communications division. And finally, many thanks to the board and our district leadership for once again supporting our Wichita Public Schools 2022 holiday banner winners. And how about as a close, one final round of applause for all of these incredible student artists. Thank you again, everyone. And Sean, before they leave, stand where you're at and have the teachers stand in the middle behind me. And then if anybody wants to get a uh, picture, we'll give you a little time to take a picture. Yeah, go ahead and get picture. That's right. Hold those pictures up high. They're beautiful. I think we've got a couple more pictures. Hang on a little longer. Okay, thank you. Thank you, President Lisa. And students and parents, I'll meet you out in the hallway for the certificates. Thank you again. And again, thank you to the teachers and to the parents for fostering this creativity. And Sean, did I get this correct? Uh, the organization is downtownwichita.org. Okay. If you want to look at the uh, pictures again, uh, go to downtownwichita.org to see all the uh, pictures uh, that will be hanging downtown. Okay. Wichita, downtownwichita.org slash banners. Okay, good, good. Thank you. For, for those in attendance and have grabbed one of our uh, hard copies of our agenda, it's also on there, downtown Wichita, all one word, dot org slash banners. Thank you very much. That was wonderful. Uh, Patrick, next item, please. Next item, under reports, Service Employees International. Welcome, Esau. Good evening. Thank you. 
Uh, greetings, board members, President Reeser, Dr. Thompson, and our thoughts are with Vice President Hedrick and her husband. Thank you for the opportunity to speak, and I really want to start off by saying thank you for the recognition of those custodians who have long served the district. I appreciate that you've taken the time to point out some of the unsung heroes in the district. Thank you for that. And, and I'm also very happy for all the children and their accomplishments. That's, that's the good side of things. Unfortunately, this evening I'm going to address some things that are a little bit more concerning, and I think it's time that we had this conversation, as difficult as it is. Um, I've got a few letters from my security officers, and I'll just read through them. I've given the board a copy of the original letters minus the name, and then um, how I wove them all together for my talk this evening. Letter one comes from a security officer that says, at my school, behavior is the worst it's ever been. The students run the school. Admin will talk to them, but not much discipline is to follow through. Kids refuse to get tardy passes and say the teacher has them when they're late to class. Also, teachers are scared to write students up due to the data that's sent out to the state at the end of the year. Teachers do not want to face repercussions. The dress code has gotten worse this past year as well. Hoodies, hats, and PJs seem to be the main issue. When I ask a student to take down their hoodie, they buck back and say smart aleck things. And I'm called every name in the book. I tell ad admin, but it just gets swept under the rug. Students walk down the hallways using language like they're at a nightclub, and admin will not take care of it. This is page 30 of our student handbook about dress code. And you can see in the last few pages that he made a photocopy of that, but I think you're all familiar with the school dress code. And, and this is letter number two. The Wichita USD 259 public school system is designed to educate our students for their future. So why are we allowing staff and teachers to be cursed out? Staff and teachers to be told by the students what they are and aren't going to do. Staff and teachers being called every name in the book but a child of God. Why is that teachers don't enjoy teaching anymore? Why are we allowing students to put their hands on staff, administrators, adults, or security officers working in the building? If it was PD, charges would be pressed. Why are students with chronic behavior not going to class being overlooked and ignored? Why are we allowing students to come to school dressed in tube tops, halter tops, exposing their bellies and cleavage for God and everybody else to see? Why are there no rules against showing your buttocks via saggy pants and or pajamas? Why are we not enforcing the district's dress code? Our current policies and procedures are, and consequences are ineffective and outdated. The consequences that are being applied are ineffective because they're not utilized in the right manner. If we're going to have restorative practices, those restorative practices need to be worked out with the person who was harmed. And many times, students will kick or hit a staff member or a teacher, and they're sent to the principal, where they behave for the rest of the hour, and then return to the class with some sort of reward. The only thing we're doing here is reinforcing negative behavior. We're going to, if we're going to engage in restorative practices, let's do it, but let's do it right. Sitting in ISS for a day or two or even getting a five-day suspension for fighting is like a slap on the wrist. The consequences for students' inappropriate behavior should be consistent across the district and not vary from school to school. In addition, we must start holding our parents more accountable for their children or their children's actions. Parents always want to hold staff accountable, but are unwilling to realize that the apple is not fallen very far from the tree, and the behavior from students and parents is unacceptable on many occasions. Education is a right, but in many of the schools, the rights of those students are being violated regularly by students who cannot and will not control themselves or follow the rules. If a student cannot follow the rules of the school system, that must be taught. We can't continue to try and design a curriculum where teachers and educators and staff have to learn how to work around bad behavior exhibited by these students. We understand that many students have trauma 
And unfortunately, those undone with traumas have for the past few decades spilled over into the classroom and robbed well-behaved students of their learning time. We as educators, security officers, and staff shouldn't be fearful to come to work or have the daily concern of what will happen next. We come to work every day to serve the community, and this is your responsibility to make it a safe work environment. Unfortunately, if we were handing out grades, USD 259 is struggling to make an F into a D minus. We should not, we should be providing public education, but it feels like we're running a correctional institution. This mayhem has to stop before someone gets killed, or is that what has to happen before we get your attention? And lastly, I'll read letter three. This is a note full of information compiled from our security team. It seems that our district is not consistent on how they deal with incidents. Certain students get treated different than others. And perhaps this is because the administrators are afraid of the parents and want to avoid conflict, but we can't afford to do that anymore. Over a three-day period, there were approximately 50 marijuana vape pens taken from students. And it appears the district believes that it's okay to just slap them on the wrist. Yet, to get a job at USD 259, all employees must pass a drug test. Oh, the irony. This is an institution of learning, and it should not be a hotbed of drug dealing. The students who choose to do better, or who choose to batter and assault one another, have complete disregard for the staff and the other adults in the building. While trying to break up fights, security guards are often jumped by students who are either trying to block the entrance in so they can't break up the fight, or they're vid vid busy videotaping what's happening so they can post it on Wichita fights on TikTok. Daily, you can see school-aged tough guys and girls duking it out. Um, it's been said repeatedly, but it's only the select few are, who are causing the problems. But unfortunately, those few are creating a disruption that is hurting all of our students, our staff, and our community. Parents should be more accountable for their students' behavior and when these things happen, there should be a zero tolerance consequence that that student and the family must deal with. Last year in negotiations, we agreed to a behavior work group. And unfortunately, we've met twice in the past eight and a half months. And five out of those eight and a half months, there has been nearly a daily altercation throughout the district. But we've also found guns, children and staff, have been put in the hospital, and we cannot continue to try to meet the students where they are as the greater good is suffering for the sinful few. We've had too many staff members suffer life-changing injuries while trying to serve the students in USD 259. Enough is enough, and we demand drastic changes immediately. We have been patient, but our patience is gone and it is your responsibility to provide a safe working environment for your employees. And one last thing, the public often makes the comments that the district is top heavy and that they have too much administration. And I don't know if that's the case, but I certainly know that the people who are making the decisions about the classroom cannot just continue to come in and observe and give advice. If you don't regularly work in the classroom, you really have no idea what's happening in those classrooms, nor how to fix it. The problem has to be something that we are all working on, and it's time to get back to the basics of enforcing the rules fairly and evenly across the board before public education is destroyed due to the lack of action by those in power. And I do want to say that this isn't because of COVID. This didn't just happen this year with this board. Our public education system has been on a steady decline for the past 30 years since I graduated in 1993. And I saw it coming then, and it has continued to go down, and it has continued to be a harder and harder position to fill. And I don't know exactly how we're going to fix it, but I hope that the school board members will take the time to come and be a part of the behavior group 
so that we can discuss what real changes are going to happen real fast. Thank you for your time this evening. Thank you, Esau. <laughs> Patrick, next item, please. Next item, under reports, United Teachers of Wichita. Welcome, Katie. Hello, board members, President Reeser, Dr. Thompson. During negotiations for this year's contract, you, the BOE, agreed to a memorandum of understanding, forming a behavior work group to review and study district-wide student behavior in the wake of the COVID-19 pandemic. The teachers' negotia negotiations team assumed you, the Board of Education, agreed to this work group in good faith. Disappointingly, UTW was losing faith in the seriousness that this board had regarding the work group because in mid-November, six months after we signed the Memorandum of Understanding, we were informed that the work group had only discussed student behavior for around 20 to 25 minutes. My intention as the UTW president was to attend the December 8th behavior work group meeting as a silent observer. Imagine my shock when, the day after I told news reporters that UTW, SEIU, and the Board of Education were working together to find solutions to student behavior issues, that I received an email that I was banned from the meeting. I've expressed UTW's concerns to the district leadership team and to the BOE members, and I've had the assurance from everyone that I've spoken with that this group will meet more frequently and actually come up with solutions to help improve behaviors, which will improve the learning environment for all of our students. The board's negotiations representative has asked to exchange negotiations proposal early this year with hope of reaching an early agreement, but student behavior must be addressed. As a result, UTW will need to bring language to the table regarding which was not explored by the work group. As president of UTW, I gave word to your representative that the UTW team would work to have our proposals ready by January 25th. I still intend to do so. However, without any solutions presented by the behavior work group, we will need to base our proposals on suggestions from our workload survey, which will be sent out when teachers return in early January. I'm hopeful this does not cause a delay in the exchange, and I will keep your representative informed. Finally, while UTW is okay with attempts to start earlier than normal to reach an agreement, we do wanna to stress to this board that if we really wanna be the district of choice and keep our wonderful teachers and staff, our salary and benefits package needs to be the top choice in the region. Thank you. Thank you, Katie. Patrick, next item, please. Next item, public communications. Marcus Curran. Marcus, did I say your name uh, correct? Curran, yes, I'm sorry. Yes. And Marcus, we have a three minute uh, time limit on the uh, public communications and it will be up in the corner of the screen. Um, no pressure. No pressure. <laughs> Hopefully you practice your presentation. <laughs> well, thank you for having me this evening. Uh, my name is Marcus Curran um, and it's a pleasure to speak with the board and Dr. Thompson. Um, I represent the Sheet Metal Workers Local Union here out of Wichita, Kansas. Um, we have about 200 journeymen and 50 apprentices currently. Um, we primarily focus in HVAC construction. Um, first, I'd like to applaud you guys for taking serious consideration on indoor air quality and, and making some actual investments in that area. Um, the reason I'm here, our organization monitors construction projects in the central and western Kansas areas. Um, the school district recently put out four bids for four elementary schools that had HVAC upgrades, Jefferson, Cessna, Cloud, and Benton Elementary. They're all scheduled to take place in the summer of 2023. The four schools went out all with the project title of S or HVAC upgrade hyphen the school and renovations on, on one. Um, three out of four of these were approved at the November 7th meeting. Um, these projects all in, with all intent appear to be using the ESSER funds from the federal government. Um, with ESSER funds come federal guidelines, including Davis-Bacon wage determinations on any construction project that's valued over $2,000. I handed out um, one from the Department of Labor, a general 
view of what Davis Bacon is, and as well as one from our international union out of the DC office who wrote one specifically for the ESSER funds. Um, so what concerned me? So we noticed multiple things that threw up red flags to our organization, and I, and I want to reiterate that none of these um, are to accuse of any miswrongdoing or anything like that. So the first red flag was it all looked like it was going to use ESSER funds. The wording, the project names, the minutes from the meeting, the agenda. Um, so it looked and appeared to use ESSER funds. But there was no Davis-Bacon wage requirements in the bid process. And so we wanted to know if the board approved these projects with the intent of using these ESSER funds. And if so, it should be made right and Davis-Bacon wage requirements should be applied to these. Um, the four bidding requirements for the schools, there were six projects last summer that were very similar in almost every aspect. They all included this Davis-Bacon wage provisions, and um, so we're curious as to what changed from last summer to this summer. Uh, the ESSER funds are a use it or lose it, I believe, with that, and so they have a deadline of September 2024, um, so we're curious as why it's not being used effect uh, rapidly and to make sure it all gets used. And to close, uh, we know that there's um, an unprecedented amount of federal money that's being introduced, and specifically to schools and to combat um, energy and uh, indoor air quality. And we'd like to see Wichita be the example, and I think you've been doing a pretty solid job on this. And uh, we're just here to kind of get an understanding of if the federal guidelines were applied, we don't want to see those funds jeopardized in any means, and we want to see them use the appropriate uh, guidelines necessary. So thank you for your time, and uh, I'm welcome to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Marcus. We appreciate you bringing this atten uh, item to our attention. Patrick, next item, please. Next item, under education, multilingual education services and English for speakers of other languages. I'll have Dr. Thompson introduce this topic. I have two of my colleagues uh, coming, um, Andy, Dr. Andy Geeson and Shannon Benoit Benoit um, is coming forward. And um, this is uh, in response to a request. I believe the request was made by um, Ernestine. Ernestine Crable. Um, she was interested in learning more about the uh, multi-educational systems in our ESOL um, programs within our school district. and so. Here we are to uh, honor her request. So I'll turn it over to my colleagues uh, to move us forward. Very Thank good. you. Uh, we're gonna try to do what we can to fit inside the same three minutes. <laughs> <laughs> good evening, Dr. Alicia Thompson, President Reeser, and school board members. Like Dr. Thompson said, we are here on a request from Ernestine Crable tonight. So tonight, Andy and I are going to give some information about our MES program here in Wichita and also the ESOL program. As you know, across the nation, English language learners are challenged with learning English while at the same time learning grade level academic content. As you know, our mission prepares all students to achieve college, career, and life readiness through an innovative and rigorous educational experience. That is no different for our ESOL students. Tonight, I will describe what supports MES provides for families, schools, and staff across the district. MES is the Multilingual Educational Center. It is located at the Dunbar campus. In case you don't know, there's our, our picture of our, our front door there. Um, tonight, I will be um, talking to you about what happens when a family walks through the doors of MES, and then Andy will talk to you about what happens once they leave MES and they enter our school buildings. Currently, Wichita Public School has 109 languages represented in 93 countries of birth. Our top five languages are English, Spanish, Vietnamese, Swahili, and Arabic. Our top five countries of birth are from the United States, Mexico, Afghanistan, Vietnam, and Tanzania. Our current refugee students are at 761. We serve 7,285 students in our ESOL programs. Our newcomers are at 808 students. And how that breaks down is 272 students are served in elementary schools, 
198 students are served in our middle schools and 338 students are served in our high schools. That gives us the total of 808 newcomers. The MES building serves and assists Wichita Public School English language learners and their families. Dunbar is the home to several programs, including our newcomer ESOL enrollment, migrant education program, the Wichita Family Learning Program, our district translation services, and our language line. MES is the central point for newly arrived ESOL students. Since the last week of July, MES has enrolled 720 ESOL families. MES is the central point of contact for students and families who are new to the district and a, have a language other than English in their backgrounds. At MES, students' English language skills are tested so they are placed in the best program for their English proficiency. Parents also receive um, support completing enrollment and the MES staff members answer parents' questions about the Wichita Public Schools, and we also provide information about community resources and wraparound services if it's needed for the student. MES is open from 7.30 a.m. to 5 p.m. Monday through Friday. All students come into our center for the enrollment process, I'm sorry, as students come into our um, center for the enrollment process, we have many ways to support them. Some of the ways we support them is through translation, interpretation, and enrollment. And I did want you to note the difference between interpretation and translation. Translation is the written, and interpretation is the verbal support. We are fortunate at Wichita Public Schools to be able to offer four different supports for our families around communication. Number one is the district's language line. Currently, we have in-house Spanish and Vietnamese staff who manage the lines from 7.30 to five Monday through Friday, like I said earlier. We also um, have Proprio. Proprio is utilized for all of our other languages. Proprio, for those of you who don't know, is our online system that we use to help families with other languages. The language line also assists all the families with on-site enrollment when they come into Dunbar. Number two is translations. The written translation is available to support schools with translating IEPs, student handbooks, newsletters, or any other written communication that's needed for families and schools. Number three, our schools and families may request an interpreter for verbal support for conferences, parent meetings, hearings, again, IEPs, parent nights, and for any other verbal communication support that they find that they need. We do contract out some other languages for interpretations. We have um, some uh, language support aides that are also hired throughout our district. So we do have other languages available for the verbal interpretation. But again, we use Proprio for those languages that we cannot provide in-house or contract out. And then number four, of course, is our amazing strategic communication um, support that we have from Wendy's office, who also supports us with our online social media. So what is a newcomer? A newcomer are students who have language other than English spoken in their home by the student. The students score at beginner or high beginner level on most sections of the English proficiency assessment. And right now we are giving the links and lost links assessment to our students. The four areas we assess are in reading, writing, listening, and speaking. Usually these students have had an education outside the US and if the students score beginner or high beginner and they are in grades second through 12th grade, they do qualify for the newcomer program. Students in pre-K through first grade are immersed into the general ed classroom for language just like any other student beginning school. And currently, like I said earlier, we have 808 newcomers. Refugee students. Our refugee students have received protected refugee status from UNHCR. This is the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees and the United States government. UNHCR protects and assists displaced people around the world. Our top five countries who have students coming with refugee status are coming to us right now from Afghanistan, Tanzania, the Congo, Uganda, and Egypt. Just for clarification, not every refugee is a newcomer or an ESOL student. Newly arrived, 
immigrant students. These newly arrived immigrant students are, fa are also families who have made a conscious decision to leave their home and move to a foreign country with the intent of settling there. Currently, we have 834 students with an active immigrant status. Our top five countries that students are immigrating from are Mexico, Honduras, Tanzania, El Salvador, and Venezuela. A few things to note. Usually, but not always, these students have another language in the home. Usually, but not always, they qualify for ESOL services and they may or may not qualify for migrant services. So what makes a student eligible for migrant services? Families who are eligible for migrant services are families who have moved across district boundaries within the last three years. They typically have an adult family member who works in a qualifying area which is related to agriculture or meat processing. Their work also has to be temporary or seasonal. Our current migrant program provides educational supports for reading, math, and other content areas. We also assist with students accumulating credits graduation for graduation. We help families understand what that means and what they need for graduation. We also support families with transitions into schools and the community here within the Wichita area. We do run a 12 month a year program. Some districts run nine months, we run the 12 month a year. And we serve 192 migrant students right now, ages birth to 21. One thing to note is that our numbers change monthly due to the arrivals of new families. So here are some of the services we directly provide to our students and families who qualify for the migrant program. We do support them with home visits, birth to age 21. We support families with academics. We work with them if there's attendance issues. We also educate them, like I said before, on what it takes for graduation because sometimes um, families just need to have the process explained to them in their language. We also talk about how to navigate our own systems, such as parent view, busing, enrollment, nutrition services, transitions with schools, for example, how to call your student in if they're absent. So we talk to them about all those systems and we provide supports around that. We also provide outside the school day ac academic activities just for our migrant students. We have grade level nights and we do some extra support in reading and math in particular. We do offer tutoring for students who need more help, and then we also provide transportation for our events so that families are able to get there who do not have transportation. Another great program we have at MES is our Family Literacy Program. This program provides free adult English classes across the district. We are currently at Marshall, Mead, Linwood, Colvin, Jackson, and we have three classes located at the Dunbar campus. Families who have a student enrolled in Wichita Public Schools are eligible for this free program. Child care is provided for all the classes. Kids Club is provided for all night classes to support school age students with homework and tutoring. Currently we have 182 adult students in our free English classes. We do provide three different times a day for families to attend. We have an AM session from 9 to 11.30, an afternoon session from 1 to 3, and a night session on Tuesdays and Thursdays from six to eight, so families that work are still able to attend. We're very fortunate to have some amazing partners that we work with. We partner with these community programs in order to ensure that we're providing the best possible services to these families before and after they walk through our doors. Some of our partners include IRC, and for those of you who don't know, IRC is the International Rescue Committee. They work in more than 40 countries and 28 U.S. cities to help people affected by humanitarian crisis. They also help countries restore health, safety, education, and economic well-being. IRC communicates with us daily on new arrivals and sets up appointments with us. KSOR, the Kansas Office for Refugees, also creates opportunities for refugees to survive and thrive in America through a network of resettlement agencies, and IRC is one of those offices. KCSL supports us with counseling and mental health supports. Screen for Success is our community screening that we also partner through Child Start and our early childhood office for students who may need some additional screenings. Giving the Basic provides our hygiene products for our families at all of our migrant events. And then of course, we also work with the Salvation Army for Operation Holiday. They've been a great help for us. 
Another great resource that we have at MES is we have what's called the Friendship Closet. It used to be called the Migrant Closet, but we have renamed that to the Friendship Closet because um, it's really available for all of our ESOL students, migrant students, uh, parents as teachers utilize it, early childhood utilizes it. So other programs um, that are also located at MES are able to use that. We also have allowed, like if families have an emergency or a crisis or a fire, they're able to come through and we provide clothes and shoes. We have home goods. Um, gosh, it's got so much stuff in there. Laundry, soap, toilet paper, all the necessities that you might need if you're just arriving to the country. Very fortunate to have that. So now that you know what happens when our families come through MES's doors, I will turn it over to Andy, who will talk to you about what happens when ESOL students enter our classrooms. She's going to talk to you about goals, programming, assessment, and some data. So a year and a half ago, um, we divided out the responsibilities. Shannon had exactly what she described and including what I'm getting ready to describe to you now. And a year and a half ago, I took over the ES ESOL portion of the department. And so the way we describe that is Shannon has just described to you meeting families at the door, enrolling them, greeting them, placing them, assessing students, and then the ESOL is the programming that takes place inside the walls of our schools. And so the ESOL department, which includes uh, myself and four curriculum specialists, we support the instruction, the programming, and services um, uh, that happen in classrooms in a number of ways. And so uh, the mission of the, of the department then is to help students obtain their academic and especially academic language as quickly as possible. So ESOL is the program and ELL, English language learners, are the students. That's, that's how it is differentiated. I, people ask me from time to time, what's the difference? Do they mean the same? They're not interchangeable. One is the program, one is the students. ESOL is also the um, endorsement on teacher licensure, and different states um, call, call the endorsement something else, um, many other descriptions, but in, in the state of Kansas, it's ESOL. So oh, doing, doing all the things here, so there we go. So the ESOL programming is immersion in English, and the program is designed for students who experience another language in their home, and ELLs do not always speak another language. Um, newcomer classrooms, as was described, host second through 12th grade students because K-1, the K-1 programming is strong in literacy. So it's a literacy immersion by design already. Language acquisition encompasses social language, which takes one to two years to achieve proficiency, and academic language, which can take five to seven years, and any amount of years in between. Instruction for um, English language learners is supported with concrete and interactive methods, including a focus on increased speaking and writing opportunities in particular. Newcomer classrooms might have anywhere from five to 10 to 15 different languages in the classroom where the teacher is addressing all the needs of students who are not speaking the same language. Um, and the students often have varying experiences of school. Some may have had no school, some may have had some school. So all the way from uh, not knowing or how to recognize how to hold a pencil, operate a computer, all the, all the way to, I just, I know all these things, but I don't know the language. ESOL instruct, instruction encompasses high interest and relevant educational experiences. So as such, our department strives to support teachers by providing the professional development around particularly increasing speaking and writing opportunities. and. Uh, for example, using circles, you may have heard lots about using circles, but that's a one way to address academic content deeply um, in a way that aligns with many other district initi initiatives. The function of the newcomer classroom is to acclimate our newest students to grade level, classroom, 
instruction as quickly as possible. It's not expected that a student would achieve mastery of the content before they're ready to transition to mainstream, but at the point that it is determined they're ready to transition, they're going to need to do so with an extreme amount of support. So we want to get them into that transitioning uh, position as quickly as possible, and it will take lots of support to do so. Here's some examples of some, some charts. The previous picture showed some students collaboratively working on some um, content. And efficient language acquisition requires hands-on and rigorous authentic experiences connected to grade level content standards. So there are lots of writing, lots of visuals, lots of talking and discussing. Language experience approach is one method of doing that. One of our summer school program opportunities uh, was developed with that concept in mind where students, uh, the teachers created these educational experiences for the purpose of acquiring students acquiring language um, and these students were able to earn um, an ELA um, credit, um, that's the word I'm looking for, elective credit, thank you, that's the word. Um, we have six newcomer sites at six elementaries three middle schools and three high schools. And we have designated ESOL sites at 33 elementaries, 12 middle schools, and six high schools. Now, our instructional specialists support any student with an um, ILP, which, an individual, which is an individual learning plan. So any student who qualifies for ESOL programming has an ILP on file and even if a parent uh, have waived the services, we are still responsible for supporting their instructional needs. So our, our specialists still go out and support all teachers with professional development and collaboration. With a focus on curriculum and instruction, this formula um, benefits all students. So standards reference grading, that critical content, coupled with engagement strategies, which we have a focus on in Wicker, writing, inquiry, collaboration, organization, and reading, and including language objectives, this is the formula for student success. So this is the back pocket thing to remember. So if we are um, creating these opportunities around these strategies and these initiatives, we're headed for student achievement. So in the ways that our teaching specialists support classroom teachers is with consultation, observation, co-teaching. Um, they may uh, plan lesson planning, intentional lesson planning, and uh, a focus on what those standards are in those grade level content areas. Technical support through the audit process, that's a big one too. Every year we come to you and ask you to approve an endorsement uh, loan forgiveness program in the district. And at any given time we have approximately 1,200 teachers in the district that have an ESOL endorsement. They come and they go and they retire and we try to recruit more. And so here are the latest numbers. We have 1,031 who are endorsed and we have an additional 129, 129 who are on a plan of study in that loan forgiveness program that you have approved. We seek program um, approval annually, and um, like I said, at any given time, there's roughly 1,200. Heights High School was the newest designated school to have the ESOL support, and when they opened up, they had approximately 20 teachers working on that initiative, initiative together, so that makes a really nice uh, collaborative uh, team. The purpose of state assessments, any assessment that's given annually or data that is compared annually assesses programs. State assessments assess programs, anything that is done annually. Um, the KELPA, you maybe have heard of, the Kansas English Language Proficiency Assessment, is the Kansas version of a federally, federally required assessment. It is the assessment that continues to qualify children for the ESOL services. And a child must be proficient in all four domains, listening, speaking, reading, and writing. 
the Kansas um, assessment program, otherwise known as the state assessments that you are so familiar with, um, also given annually, all of our ELL children are required to take those state assessments. So we have children who are not proficient with the English language expected to take and perform well on state assessments in a language that they are not proficient. They additionally are taking the KELPA. That's the piece that continually um, indicates their eligibility for the program. Newcomer students are exempt um, from taking state assessments in ELA their first year in the United States. So I want you to think about, uh, now this is going to be a metaphor that is uh, about your driving experience and you learning to drive. So I don't mean literally driving, but this is the metaphor for doing something that you're not familiar with. Think about driving and think about how you drive. You're in the left side of the car on the right side of the road. And think about if you had to make a left-hand turn, what that looks like for you. What do you have to think about? What do you have to plan for? Have you ever been somewhere else where the driving was different? That you were in the right side of the car and on the left side of the road? And what do you have to think about to make a left-hand turn or a right-hand turn? I've done that before. And I did it not knowing where I was going. I had to stop and look at the map. Pull over. Well, that's not to the right. It's to the left. So all the mechanics and the logistics about doing something that I am not familiar with, to also accomplish a task, master a task, arriving at the destination, is complicated by just the logistics of the lack of familiarity. And so we're asking our students who are not proficient at the English language to also master content at the same rate as their mainstream peers. That said, it delights me to show you this. So this is state assessment data from last spring, state assessment data, the CAP. This chart is divided into English language arts on the left and math on the right. The one is category one, the lowest uh, performing area, and the three and the four is the category of achieving a three and a four on the state assessment. If students achieve a three or a four, it is considered that they are um, academically prepared for college and career readiness. So the red numbers last spring are our English language learners. So in that left column, column one, there were 62.9% of our English language students performing at a one. Likewise, students designated as former ELL, other words, having exited our program, there were 27.3% performing at the one. So the fewer in the one, the more improvement that is. Let's look at the three and the four. <coughs> ELL students, 4.5% 4. 4. performed at a three and a four. But those that had exited our program, it was 33.75%. So there's some indications that something in our program is working. Likewise, on the right, those are math scores. This chart that you are looking at is elementary. I'm going to move to middle school chart. Same setup. Please note the percentages that were a one, then became a one, and those that were at a three and a four, and then those that were at a three and a four. So we've moved from 1.6 to 28% students demonstrating proficiency. Likewise, math is on the right. Moving you to high school. Here are the high school numbers, set up in the same way. In the six scenarios that I've shared with you, elementary, ELA, and math, middle school, ELA, and math, high school, ELA, and math, all of those 
um, scenarios for our former ELL students. The number of students performing at proficient levels were higher than our district aggregate numbers. So something in our programming is working. Now what we have for you is one point. We don't have trend data for you right now, not quality trend data. So we have a really nice baseline point. And we intend to see that grow. We attribute what we would call the success of that demonstration to the collaboration that occurs with our curriculum specialists and teachers, the training, professional development, collaboration, the differentiation, the push in. A few years ago, I can't tell you how many years ago, there was a shift in the focus that rather than pulling students out as much, the efforts were to push in and support. And so we, we believe that that shift in focus and the quality professional development that is provided on a regular basis is what we'd attribute this data point, these data points to. With a focus on strengthening the core transitioning students to the mainstream as quickly as possible. We believe that all means all and that we're on the right track with what we have going on in our programming. And at this time, we'll take any questions that you may have. Kathy. Thank you for a very thorough presentation on this program. I do have questions. I just bear with me here. <clears throat> How many students have IEPs? of these groups this year? I don't have that data. Okay. Um, however, we, the students that are in our ESOL program, the number of students, so students with an ILP, mm -hmm. different, mm -hmm. um, is commensurate in the district with the, the percentage of students that have IEPs. I don't know about the data of the crossover. There okay. is crossover. Yes. And students can have both services. Okay. Um, on page five of this, um, I think it's number 10, the newly arrived immigrant students, it says that um, families who have made a conscious decision to leave their home and move to a foreign country with the intent of settling there, do they have intent of becoming American citizens? It just depends. It's the family's choice. And do and we- it could be for any country. Okay, right. And do we offer teaching about this country? We do have a, a full GED program. After they complete our English classes, they can go into the um, GED program there at, at Dunbar, but we don't do citizenship classes. Do you think that's they, something? They, we have outside agencies that okay, provide okay, that for okay, them. Okay, that's good to know. We, okay. we do work with them. Uh -huh. Like if there's a family that comes to us and has interest, we do get them in touch with the right people. Wonderful. Um, the migrant program provides educational support for reading, math, and other content areas. What are those other content so, areas? Sometimes social emotional. We have a lot of families that sometimes come to us with trauma, and mm -hmm. we try to make sure that we're supporting them in the classroom, outside the classroom, again with some services that they may need to be, be successful. It could also be science. You know, like in science, we help a lot with science. Sometimes the vocabulary in a specific content area is tough. So we have liaison workers who will go over and work with the students at night, or um, you know, arrange a time for a tutor to come in and help support. We can do some tutoring outside of what we already provide in the district. We can hire some teachers to help support that too. Okay, and under migrant services. Um, are these students grouped together with their own language or are they just kind of like clumped together with several different languages? Um, they can be several different languages. They could be, I mean, they don't necessarily even have to be in an ESOL program. In fact, if you look, we did provide you guys um, some active migrant, yeah. Some so you, if you look at active uh, migrant student numbers, you can kind of see that they're all throughout our district in different schools. So like for example, um, West has one migrant student, so fully emerged into the program there. Then you could see Curtis has 17, but they may be emerged in newcomers or the ESOL program. It just depends on what they qualified for when they came in. 
Okay. Um, can anyone donate to the Friendship Closet? Yes. I think we need to let the community know about that. Yes, um, we do have some wonderful partners who donate. Um, one of the number one things we need are new socks and new underwear. New socks for and kids. new underwear. Everybody hears mm -hmm. that. They can hear my voice. <laughs> we can't use, uh, we don't use used or slightly used on either of those. Oh, no. So that's, that's yeah. one that is, we're always in constant need of. Well, uh, yeah, that's, yeah. Um, but we do take clothes, shoes, wonderful. coats. Wonderful. And um, in-home things because eventually they'll be getting their own homes. Yes, yes, we take everything except for anything that could be an electronic. So no TVs, no computers. Um, we typically try to stay away from lamps, that kind of stuff, just because if it doesn't work, sometimes they come back and want us to fix it. We don't have the resources to do all that, so we stopped taking electronic devices a few years ago. And I have one more question. <clears throat> I'm curious, are there any behavioral issues with our migrant students? Um, Yes, here and there, but we do go in and support the families. We, we actually do um, home visits. We work with the teacher. Typically, the teacher will reach out to one of our liaisons, tell them what the situation is, and then we go out with the translator so that we can help the families really make sure they understand what's happening in the school. Sometimes with the teacher will come with us, or we can support the building principal as well with that. But yes, we do. Thank you. I did leave off this really great graduation data slide you need to take a look at, so. Uh, Cheryl. Thank you for this excellent presentation. We, I've been um, looking forward to it, so thank you very much. I do have a few questions. Um, the. The, in the categories when you talked about the state assessments at all three levels, you had the, the current students and then the former. In the former group, what are we talking about kids that just have moved out? Or are we talking about everybody who's moved out? Who's included in that former group? I would have to ask the data folks the specifics, but um, officially when a student transitions out, we, they transition and we continue to support them and we monitor, the, monitor them for at least two years. So I would have to confirm how long the data um, Okay, but these are students in that, that, category. that are, may still be receiving some support as they move into a classroom. They would not officially, the, this group mm -hmm. would not be students who are not officially in our program any longer. Okay. So they would have moved through that transition mm -hmm. phase where we give them actual yes. support yes. and moved back into the regular classroom full time. Yes. And then so when we talk about our curriculum specialists supporting instruction anywhere at, at any of the buildings with any, we're not necessarily meeting with students or providing di direct services to students, but we're supporting teachers instructionally so that they can learn to instruct at all levels and differentiate and, and build up those <laughs> supports and scaffolds uh, for all students. Right. Uh, my next question is, you, you mentioned that we are really moving our model from pull out to push in, which means we're not, we are still pulling some we kids still out do that. the newcomers. Yes, yes. But, but as our kids gain some skills, we're moving them back into the classrooms with support. Part of that support is coming from all those teachers that you address that are taking uh, ESOL certification. Yes. Okay. Yes, yes, that's so, right. So we are trying to provide within the classroom a teacher who is certified with ESOL to be able to give that additional support. It's not always having another somebody else come into the room. Correct. correct? And then I gave you some numbers of the number of sites that have that designated support. There'll be additional teacher FTE to support a building an instructional coach, if you will, but that's mm -hmm. a, different, a different title. Um, so, uh, so the four instructional specialists that work in my department support them. So there's quite a, a conduit of support that gets down to the classroom level um, via those coach roles. Right. And I'm going to ask you a question that I'm not expecting you to know the answer <laughs> to, but I think we want to put it out there because this is what we're talking about district-wide. As we look at the numbers of kids that have made progress, and it is impressive to see the ones that are there and the ones that have, that have had the support and where they're, how they're doing, because I think if I moved to Germany tomorrow and had to go to a school, I would have a world of trouble f passing an academic test in German. Mm -hmm. 
because I don't speak German. And that's what we're asking after one year our kids to do. Um, and so to see this, these numbers really is impressive that we, are, that we are making a difference over time with our students. My question is, between the category one, which is the lowest level, mm -hmm. to the category three and four, which is where we want to get students mm -hmm. to, there's a huge chunk of students that are at level two. Mm -hmm. Because if you just look at these numbers, you've got a bunch of kids that are falling in level two. Yes. Are we in any way measuring how they're progressing in level two to be able to, because they came in as a low level two mm -hmm. and they'll go out as a three, but there's a progression in the middle there. Mm -hmm. Are we looking to see if we can figure out where our kids, are they making progress at the level two, moving up to a level three? Yes, so, so in the progression, you might see that as level one decreases, level two might increase yes, for which a bit is what of time. I would so, so we can track a student moving through and identify who needs the support to move on up, um, goal setting even with um, state assessments and KELPA, and identifying, you know, if I'm a student who performed lower in one domain, like I really struggle with the reading, I've got the listening part and the speaking part and the writing part, but I really struggle, you know, we can focus in and use um, that information to drill down for students. So while I said those assessments are about assessing programs, they are, it tells us how our program is doing, we can still use that information to help drill down yeah. on individual students. And they're students. really not meant to judge growth on a student. Exactly. But, but exactly. as a group, we, we need to be looking at that. Exactly. My last question is, as I looked at your refugee countries of birth, mm -hmm. Afghanistan has by far the most of our students, 281. Tanzania has 120. And then it drops below 100 in every other country, clear down to one in Turkey. The Afghanistan and Tanzania pieces, was that driven by the particularly the Afghanistan piece by the war? Some of it was. In fact, um, last January, we enrolled 141 students from Afghanistan. There, we had so many students coming in that we actually worked with the principal over at Minaha and went over there because they were staying in those hotels over there. That's where IRC was putting them until they had um, a place to live and employment. And so we worked with Minaha to test all the students and, and that way, due to transportation issues. But a lot of those families are getting settled now, but it is it is due to some of that. And as they get settled, are, are they settling into their neighborhood schools or are we transporting them back? So we were very strategic where we placed them in the first place so that um, as we work with IRC, we kind of know where they're gonna be placed in the city. And we work with um, Fabian and his team to ensure that we're getting them on the right routes so that the child can sustain and not have to move schools because we know how important it is when they first start school and they're acclimating to the culture. We don't want to just rip that from them. So we always make sure that we're very strategic in placement so that they can sustain. Okay, great. Because I know that was, that was a surprise. Uh, in a little bit to us, it was. But, <laughs> but we we gained in Kansas. We gained a lot of refugees from Afghanistan, yeah. and our schools absorbed them, and and did quite well with them. So they did. thank you for that hard work. That was yeah. an over and above kind of thing. Thank you, yeah. Diane. Thank you for the presentation tonight. Um, and I think you've already answered this question, but I think I was writing a question down. So if you could <laughs> answer it again for me, um, how long are students considered newcomers? That varies. Um, okay. Some students are ready more quickly, and some take a little bit um, to be ready to transition. So it can vary. It, and it, when the children are younger, it tends to go more quickly. Um, that the social language comes quickly, naturally, and then the academic, lang academic language follows. Um, then when they move into, that's elementary, for example, when they move into middle school and high school, it can take a bit longer. Um, and so just one, there, there's no magic number. So it's not a length of time. It's, it's not a length it's, of time. There's an assessment. There, there's assessment, there's collaboration. Our specialists go out and sit down and meet with um, the problem solving teams even and um, a variety of departments and 
child study team. So there's collaborative conversation. We are trying to streamline some of those conversations, be more systematic about the things we're talking about, and be efficient with that transitioning time. Um, um, we have room for improvement there. It's a goal to be efficient, but there's no magic number. Okay. And then um, you said that there's the Dunbar Support Center, and then we also have schools that are taking these students as well, the newcomer schools. What is the difference between attending Dunbar and the different schools around the city? So when they come to Dunbar, we basically support them with enrollment. So we test the students so we know where they're gonna be placed, which program, and then we actually send them we talk to the parents, explain our processes, make sure we have a translator available, and then they are, at that point, assigned a school, and they go to that school to finish enrollment. So it's kind of a, a hub okay. to support families with any language that they speak, help them again with initial processes, because sometimes when they walk into a school, especially during enrollment week, <laughs> that July week, if they don't have somebody that can speak their language, it's very difficult. And we get a lot of phone calls. Not only do we manage phone calls from parents and schools, we support the schools that way as well, but just in-house, you know, just making sure that we can sit down with them. And we get Proprio on the phone too. We actually have this sign that has all the different languages, and when they come in, it says, "What do you speak this language? And they point to the language they speak, and that helps us get Proprio. We're right on the phone with them, and we can support whatever language they speak. But of course, Spanish and Vietnamese, we have in-house. We do um, hire Swahili quite a bit to be in-house with us as well so that we can support families right on site. Okay, very good. Thank you for the presentation. Yeah, thank you. And thank you. I think that's all the questions we have. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Patrick, next item, please. Next item, consent. Hazel, do you have any consent items to pull? I have none. Cheryl? I have no items tonight, thank you. Kathy? I have none. Uh, Stan Reeser, I have none. Uh, Diane? I do not. I move that we adopt the uh, consent agenda. I second. Moved by Stan, seconded by Cheryl to approve the consent agenda. I think yours is, yeah, yours is good now, Cheryl. Uh, it's, it is flash, okay, we got them all now. Motion carries 5-0. Uh, Patrick, next item, please. Next item, under policy, second review, proposed updates to transportation policies. This is our second, uh, and we can do another review if you need, uh, or we could approve it tonight. It's okay. No, you're fine. <clears throat> I've been in the exact same position, Kathy. I totally understand. And this was the school trip and student transportation and private vehicles policy. Sure. Uh, I got it. You do have it now? I got it. Okay. Thank do you. You're welcome. You are super, super. <laughs> do you have any questions on it, uh, Kathy, or concerns, or? Do you want a, uh, another reading, or are you ready to vote tonight? Well, I did. I'm so sorry. I no, you're fine. Go ahead. Okay. I had a question. Okay. Oh, okay. Uh, Cheryl? 
Yes, thank you. This policy actually has been in place for a very long time, and the additions to it are on the second page, uh, number six and seven, where they're asking anybody who transports kids to fill out a form so that it shows that they have insurance, it shows that they're you know, a, a legitimate driver's license and all those kinds of things, and this form's good for that school year, so they only have to fill it out once. And, and then the next year, if they drove again, they'd have to fill it out again. But basically, this is just our way of making sure that people have insurance on their car, that they have a valid driver's license to be driving the car, and that kind of piece. And actually, that's a good addition to, to this policy. And I'd like to make a motion that we accept this policy. I second it. Moved by Cheryl, seconded by Hazel. Any discussion? If not, we'll vote. Oh, I'm flashing again. I don't know what the problem is. It flashes, but I think it's in. Okay. Once it's blue, even if it's flashing, I think it's in. Okay. A motion you. carries 5 0. Patrick, next item, please. Next item under miscellaneous superintendent's report. So Dr. Thompson? I, yes, I have a very short report. Um, I have just wanted to take the time to just talk about the numerous opportunities that we have had, just to kind of, just reflection about this district. Um, this is an amazing um, school district and I am just proud to be uh, a member of the WPS family. Whether it's the generosity um, and the service of our students and our staff, um, the involvement of our parents is, 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 is to be commended and the support from our community. And I'm reminded time and time again about how important the WPS uh, family is to our community and how important our community is to the Wichita Public Schools. And as I prepare for the celebration of Christ's birth, I want to convey my heartfelt thanks to our WPS family for standing in the gap for those in need. Um, each of you um, are making uh, a difference in our community and I am eternally grateful for all that we as Wichita Public Schools do for our community and they do for us. Thank you, Dr. Thompson. Oh, I forgot, I, was, I need to remind everybody, yes. when you were talking, I'm trying to give out the information to look at those beautiful banners, I wanted to say it again out loud so that people can hear exactly where to go. If you wanna um, go look at the beautiful banners and you, don't, you can't uh, go to Douglas physically, you can go to downtown, I'll spell it out, D-O-W-N-T-O-W-N, -O -O no spacing, W-I-C-H-I-T-A dot org slash backslash banner downtown Wichita dot org slash backslash banner. If you go there, you'll be able to see the banners of all of the students that um, we celebrated here earlier on. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Thompson. Patrick, next item, please. Next item, Board of Education report and requests. Diane. I don't have any requests, but since we seem to update each other on what we've done between <laughs> now and the last board meeting, um, uh, I've been just active and just going to different events across the district. And uh, I went to the JROTC Veterans Day ceremony. Uh, I attended the Kansas Association of School Boards annual convention. That was a weekend conference here in Wichita and I attended the new teacher signing day. So uh, a big thank you to Wendy's team um, in making AMAC just a really a, a very special area for uh, the teachers that were signing on. So thank you to you and your team for doing that. I was actually a very well done, well organized event. And I attended North High Market Day, which actually was a lot of fun. Hazel Stabler attended that attended that with me where uh, the students set up their own booth and served food and sold it. And so Hazel and I uh, were able to buy some lunch there from some students that was quite delicious. And uh, we were at the um, 
Board of Education Get Apple Awards, and then also attended the JROTC Superintendent's Breakfast. And uh, I've also been continuing to meet with people one-on-one -on -one or in small groups, and so I spend a lot of time just listening to people and um, what they have to say. So thank you. And thank you, Diane, for your active participation. Kathy? <clears throat> I do have a request, but I'm going to say it after my reports. Um, I went to Wilbur and I observed the practice lockdown, and I would like to say that Wilbur did a magnificent job of staying in their rooms. I did a Zoom call with some of our paras um, at ESAW's request. I attended the JROTC Veterans Day ceremony along with Diane. I got to read to Janae Smith's pre-K class at Kensler, and we loved it so much that I'm going to be doing it on a monthly basis, so I'm pretty excited about that. I attended a Chambers reception and got to meet some more of members of the community. Um, I watched some of our USD 259 students perform in Metropolitan Ballet's Nutcracker, and that was, um, of course, I love the arts. I wish... Sean was still here, but it's okay. Um, I attended the Good Apple Awards ceremony, and um, it was exciting to see that I was congratulating teachers that taught my children. So that was just a pretty, pretty neat thing for me. Um, <clears throat> and I also attended the JROTC support breakfast. I, now, this last thing that I'm going to share, I, am, I had just been bursting with excitement since um, last week. Um, last meeting, if you'll recall, I mentioned that there were two JROTC cadets from Northwest High School that approached me, and they wanted to know how can we get a leadership program begun at Wilbur. And so I, I met with uh, Colonel Hester, and I met with Lieutenant Colonel Huey at Northwest High School, and they were saying that it was funds. And I have been able to secure a $5,000 donation from Mel Hamilton Ford, and it will be presented to the JROTC. OTC from Northwest High School on Wednesday. So I'm very, very excited about that. Thank you. But that is just very exciting that they want to partner with this. Diane, you participated in JROTC. They didn't have it when I went to school because it was so long ago. But I just really love that program. And Northwest High School is the only high school that their feeder middle school does not have a leadership program. So it's in the works. I'm going to just, you know, let them take care of it. I've done my part, so I'm very, very excited about this. Um, my request is <clears throat> simple. Um, can you tell me a little bit about this behavior work group? I've, I've heard it mentioned a few times tonight. Who sits on the group? How many? How are the members selected? How often do they meet? Who facilitates the group? What is the purpose of this group? And I wrote all this down for you, Dr. Thompson. What are their goals? And could the board have a monthly report by this group at each board meeting? Um, and is it a structured group? Like, is there a president, a VP, a secretary where minutes are taken? Um, and are board members permitted to attend these meetings? And that's it. Merry Christmas and Happy New Year to everybody. Thank you, Kathy. Cheryl? Yes, we have had a very active month. Uh, I could repeat all the things that Diane and Kathy have said that I attended as well, because I think it's important that we support things out in our district, and we as a board do that. Um, I've also been to some of the um, plays that uh, our, our students have done, and they stand right up there with, with any of our groups uh, in town. So. Uh, again, I say take advantage of a very well-hidden resource for entertainment in our, uh, that our district provides to this community. Um, I also want to congratulate everybody that had a big part in the turkey drive for our community. What a wonderful, joyous event that we really get our students give back. They understand the importance of service and giving back, and that shows in that turkey drive. And... Uh, we're actually three days out from being able to wrap down for the holidays, and the kids did very definitely know that out in our buildings, <laughs> and our teachers do as well. So I hope everybody has a joyous and relaxing holiday. Thank you, Cheryl. Hazel? Yes, uh, I just, I have attended also this, a lot of the same <laughs> events. Um, I would mention also um, 
I went to, I did a cultural exchange at PVE. It was a great opportunity for me to share my culture with um, the students. Um, the JROTC superintendent breakfast was really a nice event. I had the great opportunity of meeting Dr. Thompson's parents. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the JROTC Veterans Day celebration was very impressive in that I did, was not aware of the, the participation level that our students and the um, it was very structured and the students were so well behaved and so well, um, they just had a great command of the whole, the whole arena. I was very impressed with that. Um, I had the opportunity to go to Pleasant Valley and de decorate for the holidays and I had a quick visit at Earhart Magnet. The Good Apple Awards, I was very impressed that we um, were able to recognize 300 of our Good Apple recipients, and not only teachers, but also maintenance workers, p paras, parents, PTO members, and that was really, I think, a great opportunity for us to meet the community and um, show them our appreciation. The student market that Diane and I went to at North High, I was impressed with because it's an innovative program to teach the students um, entrepreneurship and the auditorium, it happens twice a year, the auditorium was full, completely full, all the way around of students who were cooking. Mm -hmm. They had to budget their own meals, they had to do a cost analysis on their portions that they served and their profit and loss, and I was very impressed with that. I think, I think we heard that one student made $700 profit, and it was a two-day event, so that was very impressive. Uh, lastly, I'd like to mention that I attended a CUBE conference where I met board members from across the nation where we met to share um, continue, continually evolving strategies being used to combat education of challenges in urban schools. I happened to be the only uh, representative from Kansas which I was very proud to represent <laughs> Kansas, <laughs> and had some great conversations with other board members from across the nation. And very, again, um, I learned nothing different from the last con con um, conference that I went to, that we all share the same problems. We are all facing the same behavioral problems, the same teacher shortages. And roundabout, we're all, all urban um, cities are really experience in pretty much the same struggles. So we are, again, not unique in that. We are sharing that across the nation, and everybody is just trying to find strategies and ways to cope with these situations. And I'm going to stop with that. Thank you. Thank you, Hazel. And um, I'm like Cheryl. I, I won't repeat every single uh, thing that I was able to attend, but uh, uh, I always appreciate um, uh, seeing each of you there when I am at an event as well. So that is, I appreciate the activity of this board. Um, spent a lot of great deal time and I need to give the community an update. Uh, what I spent a, most of my time on since the last meeting is, uh, and I wanted to give an update of our superintendent search um, and on the update on the community engagement work surrounding our superintendent search process. Uh, Ray and Associates will have targeted, uh, based off of our workshop, we will have targeted uh, stakeholder engagement sessions on January 17th, 18th, and 19th. Uh, this includes two open parent sessions that will be held at Century 2 during our showcase of choice and opportunity events on January 19th. Uh, those of you uh, new to the district, our showcase of choice and opportunities event is our uh, big gathering at Century 2 where we um, show off all the different magnet schools and different uh, options that our students have on uh, school choice. Uh, but at that session this year, we will also have two parent sessions uh, where they can participate on what they would like to see in our next uh, superintendent. In addition to these targeted sessions, we will also have an opportunity for all patrons to share their feedback. Ray and Associates has developed a feedback collection instrument called the 31 Quality Survey. This will be open to all our stakeholders 
staff, students, parents, and community in order to assess the qualities that you feel are most important for us to look for in our next superintendent. This input opportunity will also allow us to share more about what you would like prospective candidates to know about our district and our community. This survey will be open until 5 p.m. on January 20th. Uh, to participate, please visit our WPS website at usd259.org uh, backslash superintendent search. Uh, and I apologize, I did not write down the date that survey is going to be open. Until January 20th. But when will it actually be? It's open now. Okay. I wasn't 100% sure on. So it's open now, and you have until January 5 p.m., uh, January the 20th. And there will be an opportunity for when we get that uh, information collected uh, to separate out if there's any differences between uh, teachers, students, uh, and uh, stakeholders, and the general public. At that time, Rain Associates will prepare a report to the board that will be subject to our January 23rd meeting. So after, this, um, after the surveys and the stakeholder meetings are over, uh, the board will get a report at our next meeting on January 23rd. Patrick, do we have any other meetings before January 23rd? That is, uh, I mean, we have our regular January meeting. And when is that? I'd, I'll have to look that up real quick. And Jan that is the regular. That is the regular meeting. Okay. That's what I was. That's what I was wondering. So at our next regular meeting, we will have a report to the board on the collection of this information and the feedback the public, the students, the teachers, and our stakeholders give us. We will also have an opportunity to review and approve the superintendent profile document at the January twenty third meeting. So as you can see, our January 23rd meeting will be very important. This profile will be the basis for the position listing that will be posted publicly by Ray and Associates on January 24th. And as per our vote on the workshop, uh, we will start with internal candidates and then we will proceed from there. Um, I will make a copy of this uh, and make sure each board member kind of gets an update uh, of what, how, where are we are at on our superintendent search. All right, Patrick, next item, please. Next item, new business. Seeing none on our new fancy BOEQ. Uh, next item, Patrick. Next item, adjournment. I move that we adjourn. I second. Moved by uh, Cheryl and seconded by Kathy to adjourn. I guess I want to stay here. <laughs> it won't let me in. I vote yes. <laughs> Motion carries 5-0. Uh, the second half of our new BOEQ will, uh, uh, on the voting will probably be available at the January 23rd meeting. So we've got the uh, raising hand part of it. Now uh, next meeting we'll hopefully have the um, voting portion as well. We are now adjourned and we'll see everyone uh, January 23rd. Have a great holiday. Thank you.